we serve a risen Savior. We serve a Jesus who is alive and coming back for you and I. No matter where you sit on the denominational spectrum, we can all agree on that. He's, 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 he died for us and he's coming back for us. And uh, that's, that's enough to praise for. Okay, you guys can go home. We've had church. We've had church. No, <laughs> really good to see you guys. Hey, the title of my sermon this morning, and it's just matched all the songs, um, it's called Grave Robber. Yeah, Grave Robber, a little bit, a little bit cheeky, Grave Robber. That's, that's the thought I want to preach from, um, from this morning. And before I get into the main chunk of my sermon, I've just got this, just this little bit at the start I want to share with you. It's not my main story, but there's a key in a verse here that I really want you to catch and just to set you up for my sermon. It's the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And his sisters are, are mourning the death of, of their brother Lazarus. And they're, they're right in the middle of weeping. And what makes this story so heart-wrenching for the sisters is they got to Jesus early. They said, my brother is sick. And if you come now, maybe there's a chance he can live. Jesus comes four days later after the death of the brother. So there is a lot of mixed emotions going on. But there is this little verse in here, and it might seem a little out of context, and I'll, I'll get into it in a second. But verse 28 of John chapter 11 says this, Then she, Martha, returned to Mary, which is her sister, after having been with Jesus, and she called Mary aside from the mourners because her brother died, and told her, and this is what I want you to catch, the teacher is here and wants to see you. The teacher is here and wants to see you. Not just Pastor Jordan, not just Pastor Taylor, not all the elders and the deacons and those that seem religiously elite. No, no, no. He wants to see you. The teacher is here. What are you going to do with that? We were in that prayer meeting just out there, and there was a real sense of the Lord is here. God is in our midst. What? would you do if he stepped into the room? If Jesus right now stepped into the room, what would you do? You would praise like nothing else. You would worship with all your heart. You would, you would just want to get close to him. If Jesus stepped into the room right now, you better believe it would make you bold. Just like blind Bartimaeus. Son of David, have mercy on me. Cries out from the pack. And the people try to shut him up. The crowd's like, stop, don't bother the teacher. Son of David, have mercy on me. Sure, shut up. Go away. Son of David, have mercy on me. Something about his presence makes us bold. I just feel led to go this way. This isn't my sermon, but I feel there's something here. What happened with that woman, who I believe goes by the name of Veronica, because it's coming up now in studies, the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, wasn't it? 12 years, issue of blood. She had a condition that society says, you need to go. You, 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 you need to be in isolation. You're unclean. You can't be around here. Just the emotional hurt, just the emotional oppression, just the struggle she would have gone through. And yet when Jesus steps into town, that all falls to the wayside. And she says, no, I need to see my Jesus. I just got to get into him. I just got to get into his presence. I don't care what people say. I don't care what they do to me. My king is there and I'm going to go. And I don't even need to hear his voice. I just want to touch his garment. Something about when the presence of Jesus, the presence of God is in the place, it makes you bold. And I just want to tell you right now, the teacher is here. The king is here. So what are you going to do? Are you going to sit back? Or are you going to be all in? Because your miracle it could be one moment away. That, that encounter that changes you forever is one moment away. Don't let your flesh or the enemy or apathy or complacency stop you from being all in with him. All right, I'll preach now. <laughs> I want to go to Luke 24, and this is what I, Luke 24 is my main story, my assignment for the morning, and uh, if, it's going to sound like an Easter message. I, I, I think he's getting us ready 
for something powerful on Easter. But very early, verse 1, Luke 24. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their face to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? The NIV will say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And that's the question I want to ask you. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who had told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men. They didn't believe it. And that's kind of what's happening with the world. This story of Jesus and the gospel and Christianity just sounds like nonsense. But it was the women who went to see. And now it's about to be Peter who's about to run up and see this empty tomb. I just want to encourage you to come close and see for yourself. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping in, he peered and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. Could you imagine being a disciple of Jesus, not just in this time, but in this moment? Could you imagine the tension That your leader is dead. Your Messiah, the the one who was promised to come and set you free. You've been waiting for 400 years. You and your ancestors waiting for 400 years for the Messiah. Here he comes. He's doing all these miracles. You've seen him do incredible things. And now he's dead. Can you imagine what they're feeling? We left everything to follow you. I, I gave it all up to follow you. And now you're dead. Like, you were the one that was supposed to bring hope. Now where's hope going to come from? you got to understand, they were, they were believing that Jesus was going to set them free from the Roman oppression, from, from their enemies. But their enemies have killed their leader. Imagine this. And then you go to the tomb. Gee, imagine this one. You go to the grave or tomb of a loved one, and you just see things amiss. The entrance is opened. The linens that held the body of your loved one just laid on the ground, and then the body of your loved one gone. How would you feel? I I already feel anger. (laughs) I already feel frustration. Imagine how you would feel. A crazy time to be a disciple of Jesus. For all reasonable purposes, it looks like, looks like Jesus has failed. It looks like, more personally, that he has failed them. I wonder, have you ever felt that? Felt like that? Jesus, I'm your son. I'm your daughter. Why is this happening? Have you ever felt like that? I know we don't want to um, uh, admit to that, but have you ever felt like, Jesus, I, I can't see you in this. I feel like you failed me. John 11, the story I opened up with, gives an account of two sisters who were grieving the loss of their brother. Right? And they're waiting on Jesus for a miracle. And they were in Jesus' inner circle. They were very close to him. And so if anyone's going to get a miracle, they're thinking, well, we know him. We're close to him. Surely he's going to come through for us. What hurts is they notified Jesus before their brother's death that they needed him. Like I said, Jesus shows up four days later after the death. And it looks like he too has failed them. Right? In both of these stories, the people are wondering, if he was not our hope, then who is? Where are we going to find this hope? Now, I don't blame them for thinking that. I mean, after all, death is final, isn't it? Is it? I mean, after all, there's no way out of death, right? <laughs> there is a parallel in both of these stories. In Luke 24, the angels remind the women of the words Jesus spoke to them before he died, saying... I will rise again. These words were to prepare them for his death and for the promised life that would come after. 
In John 11, Jesus prophesied before he went to visit Mary and Martha and said, this will not end in death. He again speaks those words to Martha when he sees her. This will not end in death. He gives clues to Martha about the intention of what he's about to do and why he came late. He says things like, your brother will rise again. Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And I just want to jump in right here, right now and say it might look like it's all lost. It might look like death. It might look like there's no hope. But I serve a Jesus who is the resurrection and is the life. And if you would just dare to believe, something can come out of this as well. But just like he got to Mary and Martha before the death, or the word was spoken before the death, just like the angels reminded of Jesus' words before he died. I want to ask you, what has Jesus spoken to you? Because I guarantee you, he's got to you first. I guarantee you, he's got to you before the struggle. I guarantee you, he got to you before the things went pear-shaped. But now you've got to recall those things and stand on his word. His word got to them first. His word got to them first because his word sustains. Jesus is faithful. He's not going to let you go through something without preparing you for it. But we've got to be mature and disciplined and recall the words he's spoken. That's why when prophecies get spoken out here, write them down. When the word is spoken every week, look it up. Look at it back. It might not hit you now. It might be for a month's time. You never know. But he gets to you first so that you can get through what you're going through. And it may look like death. It may look like no hope. But he's trying to tell them, I am the resurrection and life. And if you would just believe in me, I can turn something good out of this. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but Jesus had a knack for ruffling feathers. He liked stirring the pot. He liked to to flip the script. Like I was saying, he's telling Mary and Martha, right as they're mourning, your brother will rise again. Like, imagine the, the confusion. I am the resurrection and life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who believes in me will never die. And then ask Martha, do you believe this? We go a little further into the story, and Jesus is now at the gravesite. It's at the funeral service. He's at the tomb of Lazarus. And he boldly says in verse 4 to all of them, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? That's our theme for the year, show me your glory. Church, I want to ask you, do you believe? Because if you believe, (laughs) you can move a mountain, my friend. If you believe, (laughs) what is impossible? Do you believe that you will see the glory of God this year? Verse 43, he tells Lazarus to come out of the grave and out comes Lazarus, looking like Michael Jackson's thriller, in the flesh, resurrected from the dead, proving Jesus was everything he claimed to be, the resurrection and the life. What I love about this story is it's speaking to Luke 24, speaking to his own crucifixion and burial and resurrection, that this is what I intend to do with my body. He's he's preparing us through someone else's story. Don't worry. It's going to look real bad in the moment. Uh, You're going to see your king nailed to a cross. And you're going to see them do terrible things to my my body. But I will rise again. But this is what I I, I just can't wait to the end of the sermon. He says, if you're united with me, you too share in my resurrected state. Meaning that no matter what you go through, there is resurrection life within you. You don't have to fear death because Jesus conquered it. I know that's such an offensive thing to think about, but he conquered death, hell, and the grave. To be absent from the body is to be present with my Jesus. I don't taste death. It's not some fairy tale or dreamland I step into when I die. I go right from here to there into real life. We think this is real? Homie, wait till you see that. So I go from theologian to hood real quick in my... (laughs) In my vocabulary. (laughs) Real life. Because he conquered death, hell, and the grave. Why am I bringing this up? Because I don't know what's going on with you. Maybe there's nothing. Maybe this is the message you need to carry to your family or your friends. But there is nothing impossible for Jesus. There is nothing impossible for Jesus. And things might be trying to distract you. Things might be trying to discourage you. 
But if you would just believe, you would see his glory. If he can conquer death, hell, and the grave, he can help you conquer that addiction. Mm. He can help you conquer that shame. He, he can help you conquer that, that turmoil. He can help you get out of that marriage problem. He can help you with that financial stuff. He can help you with what you're carrying. If he can conquer the grave, he can help me in my anxiety. He can help me in my stress. Are you seeing what I'm trying to, to tell you this morning? When you look at what he's done, it should make you bold. Don't look at the promised land and then look at yourself. Don't look at the giant and then look at yourself. You will indeed look like a grasshopper. You will indeed look small. But look at the giant and then look at your God. Look at what he's calling you into and then look at your God. Now let that fill you with faith. Now let that fill you with strength. All right, Lord, you're going to get me through this. You're going to get me through this. All right, back to the story at hand, Luke 24. The women in verse 3 find the tomb empty. Then again, verse 12, Peter sees the linen. He sees from himself, Jesus is not here, he is risen. This moment and Lazarus walking out of the tomb, these, these moments aren't for Jesus. These moments aren't for God. These moments aren't some spiritual flex. These moments are for us to see what is possible with him. And when you, can you imagine Lazarus being raised from the dead and then living on afterward? How would you live? Like, you couldn't threaten the dude. Bro, I'm going to kill you if you... Man, I've been there, done that. Like, how bold would Lazarus have been living life? Oh, no, things are tight here. Man, he raised me from the dead. I don't care. He's going to get me through. That's what Jesus' death should do for you. If he did that, and my life is united with him, what is impossible? Death shouldn't be something we fear. Death, Jesus' death especially, oh, he brought me life and life more abundantly. That's what I'm about to get into. When they see the tomb empty, they see that death had not won. When they see Lazarus walk out of the tomb, when Jairus sees his baby girl rise from the dead, Man, Jesus is good with dead things. What does that tell us? That nothing can conquer us. There is always hope. That nothing is too big for God. When we see the cross, the tomb, the resurrection, we should be filled with hope and become bold because if that's possible, what else is possible? But in both John 11 and Luke 24, we see that there is life after death and that Jesus has all power and all authority even over death. He didn't want us to fear death or doubt what happens after death. And so Jesus goes through these stories and, 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 and through his miracles points to something great. And he's what he's trying to teach Mary, Martha and Jairus. And I love these words that Paul penned. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? When the women found the tomb empty, they found death empty handed. Because death claims bodies and there was nobody in that tomb. Death claims bodies and the soul and the spirit within. But Jesus made a way for you to live on afterwards with him. Crazy. I can see you turning up in here. In 1 Corinthians it says we pass from death. You, your body goes to the dust. But your soul and spirit right with him and you get a new body in heaven. That should make you bold. What can this world do to me? What can people do to me? What can happen to me? If Jesus is with me and conquered the grave, man, let's go out there and be bold and preach the gospel. Let's go out there and advance his kingdom. Let's go and see what can I do with my gifts and talents? How can I advance the kingdom of God? It should make you bold. If death is no longer a threat for us, that should change how we live. If we have life more abundantly now with him in this earth, 
and life with him eternal in the next. What immense joy and hope that brings. Wow. Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do any more to you after that. Now, I'm not saying something tragic is about to happen, but we do need to live with this eternal perspective that I'm not going to fear man. I'm not going to fear the world. Yes, I tell you to whom to fear, fear God. Fear God. He's the one to fear. Jesus sits by the corpse of Jairus' daughter. I just touched on that, but I didn't give the story. Jesus sits by the corpse of Jairus' daughter, 12 years old, I'm pretty sure, or 8 years old, one of the two, I, I forgot. And Jairus is just beside himself. My daughter is dead. And like the sisters, he got to Jesus first, before it happened. But now they're there, the daughter's dead, and Jesus sits by this little girl. He looks at Jairus and says, don't be afraid, just believe. <laughs> don't be afraid, just believe. And he grabs the hand of this dead girl's corpse and leans down and whispers in her ear, this is Talitha Kum, which means, let a girl, which means little girl, rise up. And I believe as he sat by that corpse and as he stands at the tomb of Lazarus and as he, as he got to the disciples before he died and says, I will rise again, I believe he's looking at you. And he's saying, get up, rise up. This will not end in death. Get up out of your situation. Get up out of your turmoil. Get up out of your darkness. I am the resurrection. I am the life. And I have the power within me to get you through what you're going through. But will you believe it? Will you believe it? I've robbed the grave for you. As he told Mary to come away from the mourners, he calls us away from the things that have no life. Come away from the mourners. Come to me who is the life. I've robbed death, hell, and the grave so that you could have my life coursing through your veins. Don't you go being a grave robber. Don't go dig up your old self. Don't go dig up the things that you, you buried long ago. He robbed the grave for us. We don't go back and rob. Call back the old Jordan. Call back the old things that I've put to death. No, 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 no. You have power within you to live free and live for him. Luke 24, verse 5. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Probably one of the most important questions we can ask. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? I hear the voice of Paul saying, are you really trying to finish in the flesh what started in the spirit? If it was me who called you to Jesus, why now are you trying to do it on your own? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? There is, no, there is no eternal life that the world can offer you. I can only give you that. And your connection to me will have that eternal life running through you. You can meet every opportunity and every situation with this new life I have given you. And I just want to ask again, are you looking for the living among the dead? Are you looking for life in that thing, that someone? Jesus is life. Jesus. I don't want to say it because it sounds so corny, but Jesus is the answer. He is. It's a great bumper sticker too, but it's like, it's a truth that we need to hold on to. When I am tempted... When I want to, man, I'm telling you right now, your pastor ain't perfect. I was on the, I was listening to worship, praying with my family on the Monaro Highway, and some lady cut me off, and man, <laughs> Jesus, I need you. <laughs> why, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Matthew 16, 25, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. If I, if I try to hang on to it and try to make it work and do it in my own strength, the promise is you will lose it. But if you give up your life, and this is the heart of my sermon, if you give up your life for my sake, if you surrender to me, not just in salvation, but now every day as a Christian, just surrender your day to me, you will save your life. You will find more life. There is an invitation this morning to die to self and become who you were always meant to be. There is an invitation to crucify your old self and rise up in your new creation. 
That's what Jesus' cross purchased for you and I. New life, new creation. Our flesh will convince us that there's life in all of these things. In everything it craves, it's saying there's life in that. But we already know life isn't in that. Stop looking for life among the dead. Don't look for the living amongst the dead. These angels were asking, why are you looking for someone living at the tomb? I think this is how many people treat Jesus and their faith. We read the word like it's some historical document. Or we come to church like it's a memorial service. No, Jesus is living. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? (laughs) He's alive. And our faith is alive. And our faith is active. And Holy Spirit is on the move. And it's about partnering with him every day. And finding that activity in every day. You're on the move today. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And when I come up against a trial, this won't end in death. Is this making sense? As we approach Easter, God really wants us to own the cross. And I'm about to bring it to a close. He really wants us to own the cross. What do I mean by that? When you see Jesus hanging on the cross, Jesus' death is your death too. His resurrection is your resurrection too. What do you mean? Death to your old self. When you look at that cross, my past is dead and buried. My sin is gone. The stuff that's trying to call me back, it's dead. And then when you see him risen from the tomb, that empty tomb, that's your new life. Victory over what once tried to hold you down. That's a powerful powerful thing to grasp. Romans 6, 5 to 11. Now, there's two chunks of scripture here that I'm not really going to touch because it's just, it's preaching itself. But don't fall asleep on me. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, here it is, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. That's, that's my sermon. I am, I'm dead to my past. And when I look at these stories that I've just told you about, Death doesn't have the final say. Jesus does. Paul gives his impressive resume in Philippians 3, 7 to 11. And again, I'm just going to let this preach itself. I once thought these things. He's talking about all these achievements in life, right? I once thought these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. That's my appeal to you. What are you willing to do to gain him and become one with him? I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. And here it is, and this is my heart. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want, to, I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I want to identify myself with Jesus. And suffering for Christ, what does that mean? As a Christian, people may not like you. Your family might disown you. Your friends might look at you weird. But who cares? You might suffer for him. But if you identify with him and suffer for him, he promises you, you will feel my resurrection power within you. In that moment of persecution, in that moment of hardship, man, my power is in you. 
I once thought these things were of value. We must come to that point in our life. I thought this was valuable. I thought, I, I thought there was life in that. But man, when knowing Christ, those things just, just dim. It's that story, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Look in his face. Show me your glory. I want to know Christ. I want to gain him. I'm willing to give up everything to have more of him. What is it if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Isn't your soul much more important? (laughs) Those that are truly living. Now, I want you to hear this. Those that are truly living have died to self. When you see a Christian that's just like, this is life in, in that person. You know what I'm saying? Like truly living. It's because they've died to self. Died to the pride. Died to the stubbornness. Died to the flesh. Died to the things that are holding you back and say, Jesus, I'm all in. And let his life flood you. Let his life ooze out of you. Romans 6, 3 to 4, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus. Now, I want to address baptism real quick. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. When you go through the waters of baptism, it's summing up all my sermon. You go into that water, into that watery grave, And you're symbolizing leaving your old self, your old past behind. And you come up out of that water like Jesus came up out of that tomb in his new creation and in his new life. And my altar call today is for anyone who wants to be baptized, it's time to be baptized. And this month we're going to do that. This month we're going to go through the waters of baptism. Baptism in itself doesn't save you. That's what I believe. Baptism in itself doesn't, doesn't make you Christian. It's an outward display of an inward working. You're showing and publicly identifying with everyone around you. I'm a Christian and I've died to myself and I'm rising to life. And so if you want that, that's my altar call. That you would come and approach me. I'll put your name down and we're going to do that this month. Get your friends and family around it. I've got a cool little blow-up pool. We're putting it out front there, and it's going to be amazing. I've learned how to hook it up to the warm water too. So you're going to boom, boom, and it's going to be amazing. We're going to get it done. Or it's the Jera Pond. You, 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 you might see Jesus real fast if I baptize you in that one. So I got, I got the hook up. We're going, to, we're going to baptize people. But this is what I want. I want to be baptized into his death so that I can experience his resurrection. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. Lose your life for Jesus. I know that sounds weird, but it's like lose it for him. Be all in for him. All right. I'm going to uh, turn the music on, make me sound real nice and spiritual. We're going to hand the communion out, and I want to share this last thing. When you see the expiration date on food, what do you do? You, you, You eat it quick, don't you? You're like, the expiration date is coming fast and I'm going to eat that thing real quick. I'm not hungry and I'm trying to be good, but I'm going to eat it fast because the expiration date is coming, right? And after all, you paid for it. It costs something. It's valuable to you. You have an expiration date. I know, just trying to encourage you. Come to church, be encouraged. You got an expiration date. Your expiration date has been set. Every day you are closer to death. Yep, I know. How encouraging. Every day you are dying. Yep, your expiration date has been set. But you know the life that you live now and the life that you will have right after death has been paid for. It's, it, it cost a lot. It was valuable. Knowing that the expiration date is there, how are you going to live? 
We're so urgent to eat the food because it's about to go off. I wonder if we would show that same urgency for life. One day I will see him. One day I will meet with him. One day I will stand before him. That's going to happen. The thought of death shouldn't scare you, but make you bold and live with urgency. If I told you you were going to die Friday, how would you, how'd you feel? How would you live today? How would you live Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Mondays wouldn't be so hard, would it? Wednesday wouldn't be such a hump, would it? That's what I'm trying to say. His death should make us bold and the thought of death should make us bold. The thought of death should increase my joy and expectancy for life. The thought of death should should increase my living because one day I will go. My, My 80 to 100 years is but a vapor. And what I do in those 80, 100 years can affect my eternity. I'm not going to get into that, but like, wow, I want to live for Him and make an impact. And then finally, kick my feet up in my new robes and just chill forever with Jesus. But the thought of His death should make you bold. The thought of death for yourself shouldn't scare you because He's purchased life but it should make you live with urgency. That expiration date, I'm going to eat that food real quick. Expiration on date of my life, man, I need to vent his kingdom. I need to preach his word. I need to talk to my family. I need to talk to my friends. I need to talk to my colleagues. There are two beautiful things that God has given us to carry on the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Communion, and the waters of baptism. Two things that sum up this beautiful story. Through these acts of worship, we identify with Christ and acknowledge that He died for me, atoning for the sin that I could not atone for. He brought me back from sin. Hell has not the final say. The grave and death has no final say. Jesus does. And His presence now is right here. And He's made a way for me to live in His presence forever. And as you take the communion and as you go into the waters of baptism, it's what it's preaching to. Romans 6, 1 to 4. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it anymore? You don't have to do it anymore, guys. You don't have to go to your old self. You don't have to do it in your own strength. You don't have to worry about that thing anymore. It will be hard and it will be tough, but you've got power over it. Have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ in baptism, that's what you people are going to do when whoever wants to be baptized, you are joining with Christ. You're publicly identifying, I am His. Look at it. You were joined with Christ in baptism. We joined Him in His death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we now may also live new lives. Wow. And since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Don't look for the living among the dead. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all His glory. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you so that you can live a victorious life. That you can experience Holy Spirit power rushing through you. That you can walk into a place and just who you are in Christ shines out. He purchased that for you. Lay your hands on the sick. See Him him healed. Let's die to self so that we can be all we were meant to be. Thank you, Lord, for just who you are. (laughs) You are so good. And I just pray that you would just drive these words supernaturally into the hearts of everyone who hears it. And I pray right now that you would begin to move on the hearts for those who need to be baptized. 
Would you make them bold and just say, yeah, that's me. I, I, yeah, that's me. I'm ready to be baptized. But Father, I just thank you that all of this is possible. Church, worship, baptism, being in the presence, being with our brothers and sisters, it's all possible because of this. You died for me. As you take this church, you know me, make it personal. Think about Jesus on the cross. Think about his body. Think about it being raised to life for you. And just walk this sermon out. I want to live my new life because it's been purchased for by his body and his blood. So let's just take the, the body. Think about it. Think about it. He died for you. He died for you. <laughs> he died for you. Now the blood, take when you're ready. Purchase new life. It's been sealed. It's been done. Jeez. Thank you, Father. Awesome. Church, have the most incredible day. Have a great week. Prayer meeting feels new and so different. We were flowing in the spirit on Thursday. It was amazing. I'll see you on Thursday night, 7.30. Seven. Oh, seven. Tomorrow's bloke's place? No, okay, don't worry. I'm going to get off this, this thing, man. Let the MC be the MC. I'll see you when I see you. That's what I'm trying to say. Have a great day. Have a great morning. But hey, if you seriously, if you want to be baptized, come and talk to me. Come and talk to me. All right, let's do this. If you haven't been baptized, you don't know what it is. You want more. Well, what is that? Come talk to me before you leave. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.